Good evening, my fellow Americans. Tonight, I want to talk to you on a subject of deep concern to all Americans and, frankly, to many people around the world. That time we woke up in a podcast and had to explain manga. Our heated adventures over analyzing manga we find interesting, otherwise known as the Over Manga Cast. This week, we're taking a break from our hyperviolent shonens or our deep introspective shoujos or frankly, even the weird web comics that I still to this day qualify do not count as manga and should not be on our lineup, but hey, what little power we all have in our day-to-day lives. No, this day, this 4th of July, commemorates the birth of our great nation, and the only thing I could do in order to celebrate that was to spend as little time as possible googling the most American manga name I could possibly find. Thirty seconds later, I had found Eagle, The Making of an Asian American President by Kaiji Kawaguchi. On this episode tonight, you will listen to me and my friends discuss, overanalyze, and frankly just completely dive into volume one of this most American of dreams to come from humble beginnings and rise to the highest nation in this great land. Brings a tear to my eye. And none of this at all is being overly sarcastic, because that would, you know, be in bad taste. Happy 4th of July. Thank you, and enjoy the episode. I think that this might be another universal opening segment where we talk about uh, our familiarity with the franchise because i'm pretty sure that not a single one of us here on the cast actually knew that this thing existed before now i know i certainly didn't so when matt suggested it i'm like yeah okay whatever never heard of it let's give it a shot yeah uh matt here i needed something for the fourth of july so i searched for the most american manga i could find and then I found Eagle, the making of an Asian American president. <laughs> I mean, it is very American. It's about the political process, about elections and stuff. So, yeah. No, it, it is surprisingly less hammy than I thought it was going to be. So. <laughs> it does have its moments, though. Oh, no, it's a, it's 100 percent. It, it is written from an outside perspective, and that is apparent. <laughs> it actually highlighted a lot of a lot of things that kind of bleed over, I guess, into the public sphere that somebody who is more attuned to the inner workings of things might not be aware of. Like um, there were a lot of aspects I was not previously aware that were so apparent. So it was kind of like um, an inside joke, but at the same time, it's like, oh, wow, an outside party was able to pick up on this. Really? Wow. It must be really obvious, glaringly (laughs) obvious (laughs) kind of thing. Uh, Am am I right in my assumption? Uh, Yeah, uh, (laughs) Jacob here. Um, I thought we were reading Bacchano and then uh, this was not this instead. (laughs) So, I mean, like, I think this is even more extreme than than the normal. I didn't know what this was until it was on the reading list. But are you mad? No, I'm not the least bit mad. It's just like I didn't even know this existed until I opened up the first page. This is a happy surprise. Yeah, <laughs> it was a happy surprise. All right. How about you, Jay? Did you know anything? I about did this? not. But for me, this is a very very happy surprise and it was it, it it required that i speak introspectively because for those of you who do not know i am on the political side of things and uh i in my day job am a reporter so this was also hitting a little close to home for me as well as we uh open up in the year 2000. The year 2000. Where Senator Kenneth Yamaoka of New York has announced his candidacy on the Democratic ticket for the 2000 presidential race. I suppose we wouldn't be opening in the year 2000. It'd be the 1999, but you know what I'm getting It's at. a 2000 Not- presidential race, so 1999 of like late fall. As yeah. far as the manga yeah. is concerned, everything is the year 2000 of the presidential race. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. We we open up with uh, a quick little three page of our boy Yamaoka giving his announcement of his candidacy and then hard cut over to Japan, where reporter Takashi Joe has received the unfortunate news of his mother's passing. Uh, I will say I'm not going to have a lot of complaints about this series. 
And honestly, I, I can't even really say that the art is a complaint, but it's a very, very particular style. And I had a, a little bit of trouble telling some of the characters apart. Funny thing that um, I had a particular issue in telling, like I, I thought until they started using names, I thought at first uh, going to Japan and, and taking care of the mother's affairs was a flashback. And then they started using names and I realized uh, realized completely different character that the art style is very dated. I would say it's actually in line with, and this is my interpretation, it was very Jojo-esque. Where, oh, yeah. yeah, it wasn't like the different ethnicities were not as clearly as deline- delineated. So you kind of really had to pay attention to the context. And everybody is exceedingly broad. Yes, <laughs> that's true. Yes. One thing I will say about the art style is it is very much like a Japanese mangaka, like mimicking American comic style. Like, yeah. A lot of characters are portrayed as essentially like Superman-esque figures Mm. because it's like that big, like American style comic, like broad shoulders, like strong jaw lines. It also kind of feels like it has a similar art style. And I I predict that Jake will yell at me when I say this, but uh, it almost made me think of Gundam in terms of the way the faces look. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Yes. Yeah. The original MSG, like the... um... The uh, first couple of UC series, like up to mm-hmm. about, um, like I would say Double Zeta is about where they started to phase out this and go into different style. But, like, again, it there was a little bit of an element of uh, some of the characters looking too similar. But like, honestly, I liked the art. It gave it a classic feel, which is kind of builds into the, uh, not the aesthetic. The sort of nostalgia factor. Yeah, it was very periodic. It's a period piece. Yeah, I have to call out the problems where I see them. But like, this is a relatively minor issue. Uh, And also, it's it's a bit funny. The two characters that I literally couldn't tell apart at first. Um, We'll we'll get into that in a bit. (laughs) Yeah, we will. Mr. Joe, Takashi Joe, uh, has learned that his mother has unfortunately passed due to carbon monoxide inhalation, a broken line at her workplace. Uh, leaked a toxic amount of gas that she breathed in and, you know, uh, rip in peace. And as he is settling her affairs, he's mourning her. And we learn that he never really knew his father because his dad was a U.S. Marine going to Nam, who uh, knocked up his mom while uh, staying in Okinawa yep. for a bit. Which is a societal problem that is very systemic. Yeah, we, we get established that he, his father was in Okinawa for a week. Yeah. Not even like several months, it was like literally a week. So it's actually quite impressive that his father has kept, you know, on tap for this. Uh, the only thing that he has of his father is a picture of his two parents. Very, <laughs> very poor photography, I must say, because while we have a great picture of the mom looking uh, blissful with her lover, uh, the dad is at full military attention and you cannot see his face. There's no distinguishing it's features. Out of frame other than the it, fact- there's like a shadow over his eyes. Makes you mm-hmm. wonder who like took the picture. Like, was it just a spur of the moment, like um, Polaroid? It probably wasn't that high quality. It was just like, oh, yeah, this is this guy that I kind of have feelings for, you know? What? Yeah, it's like the photographer never got the note like, hey, could you move your cap brim up? We can't see your eyes at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's relatable. Like, it's not a bad picture. It's just unfortunate that like that's all he has because, you know, he didn't stay longer than like a week. You know, it wasn't like they had the opportunity to have like a formal picture taken or anything. It's just like. Mm-hmm you know, back in the day when we had the disposable cameras, like, yeah, that was all you had to go off. It is, it is just kind of funny where it's like, uh, oh, uh, the, the the picture happens to be out of frame so you can have the mystery of who this person is. It's interesting why they make the mystery last so long when we revealed it in like four chapters. But <laughs> yeah, like it's very much actually that was one of the things that I like as I was reading it, I noted I'm like, the only way that the obvious solution isn't the case is if is if they're like deliberately not doing the obvious thing to fool you. Um, but they give the answer to that question relatively early on, which I feel was mm-hmm. the right call. Yeah, but we're not quite there yet. There's a bit of a extra mystery element to this uh, particular photo because suddenly it's missing. It's just gone, taken right out of the family home after uh, the mysterious death of the mother and before uh joe even has the ability to or even has the time to begin to investigate this 
uh, he is whisked away from Japan off to America for a special assignment because he is a reporter for a big newspaper. I I don't know if we uh, mentioned that yet, but he's been there for like five years. He's still a fairly junior reporter, but he's got a suddenly very big assignment. He's going over to the U.S. to cover the presidential race, specifically the candidacy of Kenneth Yamaoka. Which is uh, even interesting. They note in like the thing is, um, hey, why is the presidential candidate requesting someone from our Japanese centric newspaper? Like, Mm -hmm. that's not an international newspaper. It's for the country of Japan. Like, it's very niche. I mean, I would have probably would have like immediately zeroed in. It's like, okay, why do you want this guy? Oh, I was going to mention the other thing that's particularly odd about it is they have a correspondent whose job at that paper is to cover international, you know, political stories. He's not the guy they send. Joe has basically just done some uh, like, you know, filler articles. He hasn't honed his chops. Yeah, he's he's, he's very junior. He's a BuzzFeed columnist in the year Um, 2000. (laughs) <laughs> His boss has no idea why he was picked. The Yama O campaign specifically asked for Takashi Joe. The boss has no idea why. Joe has absolutely no clue why he was selected. And I kind of feel for the poor guy who got passed over for it in lieu of Joe, because like <laughs> he's <laughs> I would like there's just so many red flags that just go off for me. I'm just like, if no one knows why he specifically was chosen given his very junior role in a completely non-affiliate paper, I'd be just like somebody has to be related to somebody. Oh. No, yeah, 100%. The international uh, relations columnist who's just like, why am I not on this beat? What happened here? That would have been my immediate, like, train of thought. I'm like, somebody has to be related to somebody. There's no... I've never... In all of the manga we've read, I've never seen someone I agree more with that they are angry because there is no reason he should have been passed up for this story (laughs) other than what's revealed. (laughs) And instead, it's the reporter who looks mysteriously like the candidate. <laughs> You're saying it's like basic bread breadcrumbs. Like, I, I just can't. Like, it was actually <laughs> spectacular that they were able to keep the tension going for as long as they would have. Because I'm, I guess yeah. I'm just jaded where I'd be just like, OK, somebody's related somehow. This isn't right. There has to be something at play. We've kind of tipped the hand at this point. Because we've mentioned, you know, Joe's mysterious father. Why was he selected for the assignment? And I mentioned the only way it's not the obvious is if they're deliberately trying to fool you into thinking it's the obvious thing. We've kind of tipped the hand at this point. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. we've revealed the plot reveal that happens about four chapters in, which if you're a diligent reader, you should have already read all of the chapters we said we were reading. But if we're surprising you... You didn't get spoiled much. You know, I also mentioned previously that I thought it was a it was a good call to do that because, you know, like trying to maintain that mystery for too long, you'd either get into the situation where it would be an what, that's it reveal. It would be the series strung me along this long to pull the rug out from under me for literally no reason. Thanks, bye. And the longer they would have strung it along, the more it would have seemed that literally every character in universe was holding the idiot ball at the exact same time. Yeah. Because how are you that bloody blind and stupid to have not figured this out? Like Matt said, they reveal this within four chapters and it adds an entire new level of stress and drama. Very very cleanly, I think, replaces the mystery of who's his father. Oh, okay, his father is Yamaoka. How and why? Well, how and why could be surprised. Yes, well, you see, the birds and the bees happened. Yes, yes, the birds and the bees happened. Uh, (laughs) More importantly... Oh, he doesn't know about girls. Uh (laughs) Shut up! (laughs) More importantly... (laughs) <laughs> yeah, the the mystery of um, whether or not circumstance circumstance is the mystery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, the the mystery changes from uh, is the person who's obviously Joe's father Joe's father. They answer that question yes, and now the much more interesting question is okay, how did uh, Yamaoka get? to where he is now, which is, you know, part of what delved into over the course of what we read. And then the other question is, why is he doing this? 
why is he calling on his estranged bastard son that they've never actually met before to report on his campaign? With the stipulation that whatever his journalist son uncovers cannot be released until after the election result. It cannot be allowed to interfere. He implores that uh, I want you to be honest. So if you want to tell the world how awful I am, that's fine. But don't release it until after the campaign is over. At which point I, in my journalist mind, immediately said, screw you, no. <laughs> I'm going to the printers right now. Sam, Sam, this is why you cannot follow a presidential campaign, because you're spilling too much tea. Way to go, Alex Hampton. <laughs> <laughs> You <laughs> listeners will get that by the time you're done we're listening to this. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're we're skipping around a bit because there's a difference between political strategy and reporting a story, but we're moving on. <laughs> We've not actually gotten to the reveal yet. Joe comes over to America and is immediately thrown headfirst into following this campaign. We're introduced uh, first to Yamaoka's daughter. This is before the point where it's been explicitly revealed that Joe also is son. Yeah, we'll talk about Rachel in a bit. Um. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about <laughs> so, Rachel in a bit. So he essentially has he essentially has his American based family. And there's a lot of tension going on between Yamaoka because Yamaoka is like, oh, these are my siblings. Do they know about me or anything like that? And then it's revealed. You Rachel know, definitely doesn't. Rachel, Rachel has no idea what's going on. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, there is that conversation of like, does it, am I the only one who's like finding out about this? Yeah, but that's getting ahead of things. We're still introducing everyone to each other. How have we managed to have two blonde Rachels in very awkward romantic situations on this show? It, hold on. Is Rachel in this blonde? I thought she was a redhead. She has light colored hair. Light colored hair. Yeah, but she's uh, Cuban. They make that explicit. Yeah, that's so. Matthew, stop it. Anyone can be blonde. Anyone can be blonde. You can bleach your hair, you can be blonde. <laughs> I guess we haven't seen uh, a color panel of her. If we have, I missed it. But whatever, this is getting beyond the point. Yeah. The point, the point is that Rachel is the press secretary of the campaign. And the love interest. It and the love interest. And we also get uh, my second favorite character, Arthur, the campaign uh, manager. I love Arthur. He is no nonsense and he is amazing. <laughs> He's great. I love him. We do a good job of establishing the tone of this series over the course of this. Oh, can we get over the fact that they throw in random American slang that doesn't make any sense? <laughs> like, all, did you know all reporters, we call them scorpions, or because we're Americans, we shorten everything, we call them scorps. And the second I saw the word scorps, I was just like, that does not make any sense. No one would ever shorten a word like that. <laughs> That's, that's not a thing. They don't call us that. <laughs> it's also kind of hilarious that it's only in that chapter where they ever use that term. We're never yeah. going to talk to you, Scorps. <laughs> <laughs> if anything, we get compared to vultures, not scorpions, but whatever. <laughs> Corps. <laughs> Sounds like a very Scorp thing to say, Sam. I look forward to being called a Scorp for the rest of my life. By these if you stories. ever want to uh, <laughs> call Sam a Scorp. Uh, please reach out at OverMangaCast. Or, uh... <laughs> anyway, we have a bit of a situation to deal with because Senator Yamaoka's lunch has been overbooked. I love this. I love this chapter so much. Just get some Toms and a larger shirt. You'll be fine. Literally. He was supposed to have a dinner with, like, the Italian-American contingent, I think, Mm -hmm. And then a press and then a press lunch with the uh, Asian American coalition. Essentially, what the manga then tells us is that means he has a giant buffet of Italian dishes, followed immediately by a giant buffet of Asian dishes. And he must clean his plate. Otherwise, they will know he is a coward. Otherwise, they see him as weak. And these have been scheduled accidentally within a half hour of each other. And because Yamaoka ain't no big... He, he says, do you want to be known as the guy who couldn't keep a lunch date? Get some Tums from Rachel, a larger size shirt, and goes to battle. He cleans every single pasta dish from his plate at the Asian American dinner and then eats a full plate at the Asian... Um, uh, the Italian. Oh, I'm sorry, the Italian American dinner and then finish his plate at the Asian American dinner. And he is stuffed to the brim, but unfortunately... 
He gives a yeah. speech after being stuffed to the brim. But unfortunately, a young girl comes from the crowd and goes, my daddy said you loved cake. I made this cake for you. <laughs> Yamaoka, as a true American, needed to make clear he loves cake and will eat it whenever it is given to him and <laughs> eat the cake. There are panels of extremely tense facial expressions of everybody watching this. Like his campaign staff is watching on and they're like sweating bullets like it's... They all have the, the pose of the dad from Evangelion going on. <laughs> Can we talk about the quote that is given by his campaign staff that is essentially like he has the stomach to eat all 50 states and all 7 million citizens? Oko, because he's watching all this nonsense. He's like, how can he eat all this food? He wants to be president. He needs yes. to eat all the food. <laughs> yes. He must have such great stamina. <laughs> and so he finishes off the cake. Uh, Joe goes into the bathroom to wash all the sweat off because this was so tense. And Yamoka's barfing in a, in a stall. <laughs> it, it ends essentially as, as you would expect it to because no one can be comfortable eating all that food. But he has a face to put, to put out there. And while his face did not flinch, all he lost was a single shirt button. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and like it, it's one of those moments where i'm reading this and it's like okay tone thusly established because <laughs> it's like there there is a element of legitimate tension to this but it's also really ridiculous it it is a hundred percent written from an outside perspective and the second chapter firmly establishes where you should be viewing this from <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. I'm just saying that he should have been, like, seeing red flags or, or feeling trapped. I mean, Italian Americans, they will feed you until you literally pass out. Oh, Asian Americans, too. Like It's a trap. Mm -hmm. It is a trap. You are not supposed to feed your entire plate. It makes sense why Arthur screamed at the guy who overbooked the lunch. Are you trying to sabotage our campaign? Oh my god, Arthur is the true hero of this, because he's just like, stop making him do ridiculous things, and Yamaoka is just like, but I want to do ridiculous things. What? I will show them how bold I am by doing something completely insane. <laughs> Don't you understand? I'm the protagonist. I can do whatever I want. Just saying, clearing a plate is a sign that you really enjoyed it and that you want more food. Oh, he didn't clear one plate at the Italian-American dinner. He had to clear a plate at each station. He had multiple pastas to eat. That, yeah. was, his, that was his mistake. <laughs> yeah, that was a mistake. I'm sorry. It just <laughs> is. You, you don't clear it. So for the listening audience, I'll just make clear. Uh, chapter two was the only one I looked at before I assigned this to our reading. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, so that's what that's what Matt kind of billed this as. And then we had the very sober drama of the dead mother in chapter one and the mystery. And I'm like, I don't know where this tone. Is. OK, here Mama it is. Protag was established, essentially. He, OK, the rest yeah. of it definitely falls in line <laughs> with the second chapter. His mother died tragically. He has a pretty mediocre existence. Now off to high drama and adventure. Mm -hmm. Yes. Then we have one of my favorite interactions between Yamaoka and Joe, because while Joe is washing off his face in the bathroom, Yamaoka finishes barfing up the several full course meals he ate and steps out of the stall, still looking immaculate somehow. <laughs> Let's just establish Yamaoka, whenever he is pictured in panel, never doesn't look like Superman. Uh-huh. Yeah. He constantly looks like Clark Kent just uh, stepped out of the gym. He walks right up to our main character and says, you're Takashi Joe, right? Yes. All right. I want you to come to the uh, gala I'm having on a boat on the Potomac with a whole bunch of political donors. Yeah, I, I don't know if any of you are fully aware of what the Potomac is like, but to imply a gala on that would be some kind of like luxurious affair is hilarious. <laughs> it really is. Saying people still have gallows on the Potomac. I mean, the, even with his reputation, it's just implied that that's the closest like water source. It, yeah. yeah, yeah. The Potomac is a very dirty body of water. You would never go on like a boat trip on that. Yeah, but I mean, it's the big famous river that flows through D.C. It's got to be cool, right? Yep. Yep. That's the only research I did while writing this manga. So here we are. <laughs> Which I, I joke, I joke, but there is like a lot of research in this manga. It's just some places it misses. 
you can tell that it's a Japanese person writing a story about American politics. You know, it's it honestly, it's impressive how close it gets at times. Yes, we, we are deriving comedy from the rare occasions it misses. But otherwise, this is pretty spot on and I'm really impressed. But mm-hmm. when it misses, it's hilarious. Yeah, which honestly, I think makes it better because like where where I feel that the tone lies after chapter two is it's somewhere in between the high drama of dead mom mystery and um, the hilarity of the second chapter, I think is the most I, I think the second chapter is where it's the most obvious that it's a Japanese person writing about American politics. The rest of what we read lies somewhere between the those two points, leaning more towards the um, sort of fun. In, in its insanity sort of you know like it's it's slightly to that mm-hmm. side we will get to my favorite character Tuck, <laughs> i love tuck i just said i loved arthur but i think i love tuck more <laughs> yeah tuck is best boy we do have a black tie event on the potomac to get to. well hold on sam what is a black tie event i own a black tie is that good enough <laughs> no you idiot that means tuxedo what <laughs> you're here mine, borrow mine. <laughs> As if tuxes aren't cut. Yeah, the fact the you can just button. take someone else's tuxedo is hilarious. <laughs> Dude, tuxedo, there is a difference there. Again, this manga is very well researched. It's clear that somebody who has a lot of passion for politics put a ton of effort into understanding the system and creating a high drama in it. It just all it's also obvious that they have not lived this yeah. like we Americans have. So <laughs> So the, the rare occasions it breaks the seam where otherwise we're expecting like this highly polished professional thing. It's hilarious because it it cuts through what is otherwise a completely well done serious thing. Yeah, which I, I think is all the better. It keeps it from becoming melodramatic because I can mm-hmm. easily see a series like this becoming very like annoyingly dry. Mm-hmm. And it didn't do that. <laughs> yeah, like a Japanese audience almost certainly would not notice this unless they were the greatest West Taboo of all time. Joe has a bit of a hard time getting onto the boat because no press is supposed to be here. Fortunately, Rachel swoops in to say, oh no, uh, the senator invited him specifically so he can come on to the boat. Kind of weird he wasn't on the guest list. Yeah, he wasn't on the guest list. That's super weird. That's not even like it's a mystery weird. That was that was they needed tension for the for the scene to get uh, Joe and Rachel to interact. Yeah, they needed the meet cue to happen. Seriously, because like Rachel's just said, like, hey, did you know my job as political correspondent is to make good with the press? You're the only press I see here. You want to dance? And then he's like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, a beautiful woman. What will I do? That's right. We haven't got the other drama yet. Yeah. Yeah. We- yeah. Well. We'll get to that. That, that whole that whole obvious reveal is is uh, still coming up soon. So. Mm-hmm. We get a few panels of of giving legally distinct oh. names to to people who are the heads of legally distinct named American corporations. Can we take a break and fully examine B and J's favorite character? The governor of Maryland's name is Dick Turner. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just the governor of Maryland's name is Dick Turner. <laughs> I had to stop reading this. Go find Jay and inform her the character's name was Dick Turner. <laughs> oh, good, good, good times. Good times. It's such a like. This is a Western name, right? I mean, <laughs> technically, <laughs> it could absolutely be a thing that happens. There is somebody out there probably named Richard Turner who is feeling very attacked right now. <laughs> they would never go by Dick. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> I, and I am terribly sorry. Sorry to all the Dick Turners out there. This is the fate that was decided for you by your parents. <laughs> but yeah, I, I love when background characters are introduced. They're always the most anglicized person you can possibly imagine. <laughs> Hey, this is a character we're not going to have to deal with. He is blonde haired, blue eyes, strong jawed in the corner. Extremely broad shoulders. Okay, the amount of wealth on display in this <laughs> manga. We'll get to the Hamptons. Oh, don't get me started on the Hamptons. <laughs> but even here, it's like, how have you packed this many people in this much nice clothing on this mm-hmm. boat? <laughs> well, that's the big thing, too. Like, the governor of Maryland is here for. Senator Yamamoto's campaign announcement. Like, he's got power. 
like insane amounts of power that governors are coming to his thing. And he's not even the front runner in no, this. No, primary. at this point, he's like fourth in line. Yeah, the, the thing that's so extraordinary about him is that he's the first Asian American presidential candidate. There's a lot of interest towards him at this point as a novelty, but the and like this is actually something that's like really well established about his character. I don't know if it, the series belabors the point a little bit, but certainly not to that much of a degree. But like when people actually meet him, he has such a presence that like a lot of people come to him as a novelty of, oh, he's uh, an Asian American running for president. How interesting. Let me see, you know, let me see this beautiful ship before it crashes. In meeting him, they understand that, oh no, this guy actually does have a chance. This man possesses an aura yeah, like the big thing we get about Yamamoto is every time he talks Yamaoka. to s- Yamaoka, sorry, every time he talks to someone, he conveys like an irredeemable air of like sincerity, like no one can question it. He is mm-hmm. sincere about what he believes in. Whether or not he is is probably a thing to debate that we would go in further volumes. But like the way he portrays himself to other people, no one questions his like idealism. Mm. Uh huh. Espe- and. It in a way that is both tarnished and reinforced with the next thing that happens because uh, Senator Yamaoka specifically wants to speak with Takashi Joe in private. And so they go to a private room on this boat. Uh, interrupting. He does interrupt his dance he's about to have with Rachel, which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> that, that was indeed hilarious. But uh, they go to a private room on this boat, which looks like a drawing room in a mansion, but whatever. Don't get me started on the fact they think boats are infinite sized things that can hold any amount of rooms. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. No, this is like five barges strapped together with a mansion on top of it. If we're Mm -hmm. actually being real about the size of this thing. On the Potomac. (laughs) On the Potomac. It's very much the situation where like the way it's drawn from the outside it looks like the kind of party boat that you could see fitting in the Potomac. When you're inside it, it looks like it's a cruise liner in the open ocean. <laughs> it, it looks like the TARDIS, yeah. <laughs> Which again, if you know nothing about the Potomac, is an entirely fair assessment to make. But us knowing what the Potomac looks like is hilarious. Uh-huh. Uh, us people who have been to or lived in D.C., yeah. But uh, they go to have their private conversation and uh, a draft of brandy, I believe. You drink brandy? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and it's at this point that Joe asks the very reasonable question. Why did you request me to be the press attache for this? I'm nobody from a foreign newspaper. Why am I here? I love how direct Yamaoka is, by the way. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. No, Yamaoka looks at him and says, because a son should know his father, shouldn't he? Oh, <gasps> <gasps> And then, like, three panels is of, like... Three wait, panels you, of shocked expressions. Are you saying you're my father? Yes. Yes. Luke, I am your father. <laughs> you should have gotten that in the first panel. But I understand you were confused. <laughs> my, no, my favorite thing is that Yamaoka barely has any expression on his face, no matter how much they zoom in on him. But they bold and underline his text bubbles to, mm-hmm. like convey the force with which he's saying this. That's actually one thing about his character that I find very intriguing. It's really obvious that like he's putting on an air. Like This is a story about politics and politicians, you know, have to present a image to the public. Like that's that's an inherent part of the job, even in an idealized system. And it's like the fact that he always has this like shield up where he always has that candidate expression on his face, even when he's in private with someone. It kind of speaks to like the way he is in like there's there's going to be some stuff a little bit later that, um, you know, also goes into this idea where, you know, like there's a wall between him and everyone else. Like even as he's saying, by the way, I'm the estranged father you never knew. There's like no emotion to it. Like hold, but it's not emotional either. And like the weird thing is he even follows up immediately of like the next after the next part of the campaign, we're going to go to the Hamptons and I'm going to introduce you to my family. But like the way he says that is even distant. He is very much every picture you see of him is that Clark Kent picture. 
And that never shatters. Like, he is always the face he displays. But, um, yeah, no, after this uh, reveal... Also, hilariously, um, Joe takes one sip of his whiskey, drops it on the ground, the glass shatters, and then he just leaves the room with that shattered glass on the ground. Do you have anything to talk about him revealing that he's the father? No, because, like I said, so many red flags. It was pretty obvious. It like, was yeah. pretty obvious. I had nothing else to add because it's just, you know, call it jaded, being jaded or whatever. But yeah, it's no, just... I, I, I'm 100 percent revealed that they got that out of the way very quickly. Mm-hmm. And then the drama became something else. The drama become became something that you don't know the obvious solution. The only way that Yamaoka wouldn't be Joe's father is if they were deliberately doing that as a twist. If they had sustained that for any length of time, it would have been incredibly frustrating. So Yamaoka is Joe's father and he gets out of the meeting. I forget why. Oh, he he has to excuse himself to go up onto the deck. And that's when Rachel comes up yeah, to him. In order to give a speech. No, Joe has to excuse himself up on the deck. Yamaoka oh. gives a speech and then Rachel comes to confront him on the deck. Yeah, I, it's very much the case where Yamaoka is like he basically says to Joe, uh, so, uh, yeah, I just dropped a bombshell on your head. I'm going to give you some time <laughs> like and 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 still with that, like distant veneer uh, over his um, mannerisms as well. Can we also establish how this manga seems to think Washington, D.C. is the Arctic? <laughs> I mean, it is like February. It's but... cold in D.C., but like, I guess it must be way colder than Japan because like everyone's in like full parkas and everything like. Sure, it's February, but they're in Virginia. Like, it, it's cold, but not that cold. <laughs> We northerners here are like, no, that's 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 a bit too much. But I guess uh <clears throat> I mean there there's a reason why I want to move to Florida, but <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, you freaking weirdo. Call the alligator to take off the street and have free pets. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, Joe has a moment where he starts uh crying because obviously honestly who wouldn't yeah have a lot dropped on him. yeah it's a lot no i feel like in, in a different situation i would be completely prepared like going back to my point of there's so many red flags i'd be just like something big has to you're, be going you're on. thinking joe must have had an idea going into this yeah. yeah i'm just saying like knowing that his colleague was passed over knowing that he has no connection other than this random Marine father of his that he's never met. In all fairness, Joe had just lost his mother, so I'm not sure how with it he was. Yeah, and I, that's what I was going to say. I, I think because he had been dealing with that grief, it's hard to say whether or not this is owing to Joe's character. Like, Joe's also putting up a bit of a veneer that he's got to be, like, cold, analytical reporter man for this. But, like... It really seemed like he didn't give it a lick of thought because it's ultra obvious for the audience looking in. But it's also so obvious that I feel like most people might be able to figure something's weird here. It's even kind of honest, uh, obvious for Joe because he goes up to the deck of the boat and is like freezing and just like, no, obviously no one thought I was a great reporter and needed to be on this beat. Like I was given this like that's what he's dealing with on the like deck of the boat. He recognizes in retrospect after he's been told that, yes, this is the only reason that makes sense. Because everything in this manga happens really fast. It's barely a month after his mother's death that all of this goes down of, of flinging him off to America. I actually think it's a matter of days. Then he gets immediately wrapped up in all the insane drama of the lunch debacle and then is <laughs> flung into the highest echelons of American politics. No human mind is prepared to process things that quickly. So while I do agree with Jay that the red flags are obvious, there are enough flashing lights and screaming sirens, metaphorically speaking, that I can honestly uh, give him a pass on not realizing it. The question is that there was just so much exposition on the fact that his mother, like there was so much exposition of he never knew his father. It would be different if he focused on solely his mother and had no clue that he even had. Like, say, for instance, he had no clue about his father, no picture, no anything. But the fact that they focused on, hey, I knew my mother was in, in love with this man from America. Huh? She never really expanded upon who this guy was. 
And that kind of distracted his attention while he was grieving his mother. It's the timing of everything. It's just kind of like, this has been an anomaly his entire life, but now he decides, oh, his mom never elaborated on who this guy was. More, she never provided that much information on him. Oh, wait, now I'm getting all this information all of a sudden. To be fair, the timing is something Joe is very aware of and constantly is like, wait, hold on, why is this all happening now? It's within a chapter that he realizes, wait a minute, my mother died. And then Yamaoka calls me to his side so he can have a constant eye To announce his presidency, his campaign for presidency, like... To some extent, some of some of what makes it so obvious is the way that the story presents the information to the audience. Because, again, from from Joe's perspective, he's living his life in this world. He's, he's basically thinking through in his mind all the information that he has. But since it's what the story is presenting us with, it becomes even more so obvious. Yeah. Again, not saying that Jay is wrong. It is screaming in your face. But everything in this manga is screaming in your face. You would be forgiven for not being able to focus on one particular. Also, thing. we're only three chapters in, so like we're. You would still not be forgiven to like see these red flags, though. I just could not forgive someone for not seeing so many red flags on like both counts. In all fairness, he is having a mental crisis about these red flags in the chapter we're talking about when Rachel comes to comfort him. <laughs> yeah. uh, he, he realizes in retrospect that, oh, I should have seen this coming, shouldn't I? Like, that's basically his reaction to this. But no time to think about that. It's time to meet the extended family. We're going to the Hampton Mansion. Can we, can we establish that they're going to the Hamptons to meet the Hampton family? Yeah, it's not really good. <laughs> God. Okay, when I said that there was an insane amount of wealth on display in this manga, I need you, uh, dear listeners, I need you to take whatever you thought I meant by that and multiply it by three and then add Victorian flair to it. Seriously, these these people are so rich, it's <laughs> ridiculous. They have never heard the phrase new money. It's old money all the way back to the queen's freaking ass on the throne. In all fairness, they must have heard new money <laughs> because Yamaoka is a self-made man. But like... It's it's so ridiculous, like the idea that they would even integrate with like such a new money person is weird because they're they're talking about how uh, look at this portrait. This is someone who was involved in the revolution and then created the first bank <laughs> in America. And that's why they're so <laughs> stupid wealthy. They are the family that is the hereditary CEOs of the first bank in America. They are stupid wealthy. <laughs> Nothing we can say <laughs> can really describe the truly disgusting amounts of money on display. So we won't belabor this point any longer. We need to meet the, Ham the Hampton family, except only two of them are actually relevant. It's Alex... Uh, Yamaoka, who is uh, Yamaoka's son, he, he is consumed by his youthful need for respect. And Patricia, Yamaoka's wife. Rachel, Yamaoka, his daughter, which they play around with um, Joe being like, oh, no, she's my half sister until they reveal she's adopted like immediately. I'm curious because I don't think they go into this. Is Alex also adopted or is he? Uh... Gotta keep some mystery. But Alex is immediately, or Rachel is immediately identified as being adopted because they have to keep that love, that love, that love connection going. Because Joe was worried it might be his half sister for half a chapter, and they were like, "That's enough." Remember, kids, it doesn't count if you say no chromo. <laughs> stop it! <laughs> stop no. it, Sam. I will not stop it. <laughs> also, don't actually say that. That doesn't count. That doesn't mean anything. Look, the important thing is that Alex is living in the, the very long shadow of his father and mm. desperately wants to be acknowledged by him, particularly because and OK, this manga loves its metaphors. Rachel being the adopted daughter and the press secretary of the campaign, it's obvious that she is the favored child. She is literally the selected child. And Alex isn't. He is ignored and dismissed by Yamaoka at basically every turn. Like, really? And like, he's hardworking, too. Oh, he's he is 
absolutely great at digging up dirt because as we'll get to in a minute, he has a essentially a, a nuke of a scandal that he can shoot at the front runner in this race at any time. Yeah, the big thing is um, Yamaoka essentially says at one point, I don't have family, I have employees. It's supposed to be like an equalizing factor, but it comes it off as... Yeah. It does not come off as equalizing, it comes off as... <laughs> yep. And that sort of, that also is one of those cases where that like sort of politician's veneer, like, he phrases it in such a way that makes it clear he means like during the campaign. Mm-hmm. But like also... They are your kids, though. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, it's one of those things that, like, sounds good messaging-wise. But realistically, it's like, come on, man, those are still your kids. Like, well, we see with Alex why it's a bad idea to do that. <laughs> if you put even an iota of thought to it, the good veneer yeah. fades very fast. So Alex's youthful desire for respect makes a lot of sense. Uh, we also have the wonderful moment of Patricia shaking hands with her husband's bastard child. The other thing is she doesn't know at that point. Exactly. It's all of that. And Joe is freaking out on the inside like she doesn't know. None of these people in this fancy ass mansion know. All of these know. people know nothing. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, Joe has a tendency of ending chapters with, with like one liner declarations. And I kind of love it. Well, it's, it's actually in a lot of ways kind of like a classic American comic book from the era the art is emulating. Like it's it's very good at m maintaining its tone so that it doesn't dip into melodrama because, again, with with the, with the family dynamic, this could get really, really irritating really fast. We spend enough time at the Hampton Mansion to meet our principal characters. And then uh, we have to head on down to Boston to meet the best character in this manga, George Tuck, legendary political consultant. I love George Tuck so much. Oh, it's it's amazing because Yamaoka, Arthur and Joe, all they step out of the car and they're like, on that boat is the eccentric man who holds the fate of this campaign in his hands. They go in to the boat and they obviously have an appointment because Yamaoka mentions at one point we need an appointment with this guy. And it's a it's a it's a houseboat. So it's just floating in the Boston. And Bay. Uh, who's who's going to be the one to to give the best line in this manga? <laughs> uh, I, I, I know I Jay like particularly loves this line. She wanted to print it out and put it on her desk at work. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Jay, how does George Tuck introduce himself? Basically saying, what are all these Democrats doing here? I'm an I'm an elephant man. Without even turning around, without even looking at them, he says, I'm that. an elephant man. Because, you don't understand. Uh, he could smell them. Yeah. A, a, as we've established, <laughs> uh, George Tucks, um, as like a political like campaign runner, his main thing is he works with a bunch of Republican senators. I'm just saying, operating off the information that he only takes appointments, he could have said something at the appointment. No, no, he 100% took the appointment knowing what he was dealing with and still said that. Yeah, and I think mm -hmm. that's sort of the point of this interaction, because as hilarious as he is, boy, does he prove that he is, you know, he is worthy of his reputation. Because to a large extent, him making that comment, don't you know I'm an elephant man, is very much a challenge to Yamaoka. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, that's the thing I love about talk. He is the guy in the shonen manga who's like, Omoshiroi, this potential, the power I see in this man. Except this is a seinen and a political drama. So he does that <laughs> to a candidate in a presidential campaign. Mm -hmm. He exudes all the same energy. And so he is constantly testing Yamaoka poking him to see like do something interesting i need some excitement in this game that we call politics instead of instead of this killing intent it's this electable intent <laughs> it's great because chuck essentially um yamaoka comes here saying i will give you 15 million dollars when i am elected if you join my campaign and tuck's response is i don't know you're still a democrat prove to me you're worth it <laughs> He's like, don't you know I only work with winners? Albert Noah, the vice president, currently has like 52% in the polls for the Democratic ticket. 
why would I ever work with you? To which uh, Yamaoka replies, yeah, but 38% of the voters say they have no enthusiasm in Albert Noah. I didn't know I worked with cowards. I don't know what it is. I love Tuck's character design. He wears a turtleneck, he has a cigarette, and he goes, ha. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. I mean, he also doesn't have a wife, family, or anything. He's just kind of a loner who just completely like, chases the, the gamble. Yeah, we do get a Seth later on. He does nothing but pre- uh, elections. Yeah. Which is kind of sad. There's no really down period. He proves that he's some sort of blackmail god able to pluck the most secret information of any political campaign out of the ether with a couple of phone calls. I- We'll get in on how much of a magician Tuck has to be. Saying, like, how sad and lonely his life must be. He doesn't have anything else except these races. He lives for the game. Yeah, seriously. Like, I mean, part of it was like, wow, he's really dedicated. And it's just like, oh, that's kind of sad. I mean, hey, he's living his truth. And uh, who can ask anything more? But we do have some literally dirty, anyone else. We do have some dirty politics to get down to because the New Hampshire primary is coming up. And as previously stated, our boy Yamaoka is not looking too good. He's got like, what, 12 percent. And Albert Noah, the vice president, has is sitting at a comfortable 51 to 52 percent Normal because he's currently vice president. So that's another skew that other people who are outside might not be aware of. You were currently in power. So obviously you have some advantage to people know who you are. You have that recognition. You have that platform that perhaps you leech off of your current acting president. So Which he does. All of, yeah. Mm-hmm. So a lot of that is bolstering those numbers. So it, I wasn't completely phased by, oh, he has over half of the vote. I'm like, yes, because they're tying you to the current administration. They know you. You have the name recognition. Perhaps the other guys who are competing don't have the name recognition you have. And you know? also he can just borrow Air Force One casually. Yeah. yeah. Actually, it's Marine One when the vice or, Oh, right. It's on. Marine One. Right. Yeah, because uh, in case you forgot that this was a Japanese manga, uh, we have to have the most e- extra entrance of all time as Noah arrives in Manchester in Marine One, dropping down in the helicopter, stepping out to a roaring crowd. It's just kind of like it's disingenuous for the vice president to kind of be all showy like that, because it's like you have access to those resources so it's not it's too much of an unfair advantage to be overly showy like that you're not competing on an even playing like playing field yeah but it looks cool and the average voter is the salt of the earth the good working man you know morons (laughs) at no point does noah pretend that he isn't flashy I'm borrowing. I am borrowing wise words from the great Gene Wilder, but we are moving (laughs) on in this manga (laughs) because uh, Alex, Alex Yamoka has a special weapon, a secret uh, battle plan, because in his exhaustive investigations and he makes sure, you know, it was exhaustive and exhausting. He has learned that. Noah has been engaged in some shady fundraising shenaniganery that could put a real black mark on his campaign. So we should fire this missile at him right away. And no, we're not doing that. Yeah, uh, this is actually one of my favorite moments from the whole thing. This was a moment that really stuck with me throughout basically the entire reading, because like there's a lot of layers to this. Shady campaign uh, funding shenanigans is something that happened to Noah in the past. And like they're talking about how, hey, he was able to dodge it last time, but, you know, people will remember last time and it'll, you know, have more of an effect. Um, which is the kind of thing that you actually see in American politics. Like we've mentioned, this is super well researched. Yamaoka and honestly, all the entire rest of the staff um, basically dismiss this out of hand. And this is something that like gets done as a reveal a little bit later, but um, it's important to understand the context of this moment. Part of what Yamaoka is doing is he wants uh, Noah to be his vice president. What Alex doesn't realize because he's not, you know, being read in on this really important detail. If they do a smear campaign against Noah, then 
he's kind of out as the vice presidential pick, isn't he? Yamaoka is very, very dismissive of all of Alex's hard work, him being distant and not, you know, talking with his son about this rather important detail that he could honestly just say to him, you know, is the reason why Alex gets so unbelievably resentful. Both Yamaoka and Arthur, you know, also mentions if you fire that missile, it might come back on us. Mm -hmm. And it's like, when you know what the ultimate plan is, that makes perfect sense. But from Alex's perspective, because he doesn't know this, like the audience doesn't know this, that doesn't make any sense. Why would you not use this? Because he's basically hinting at you that his campaign financing is not all that up, up and up. It was very obvious to me. Hey, I'm not going to admit to this, but don't throw any don't throw any shots that you aren't prepared to take yourself. And I'm letting you know in the most discreet way possible that I'm not pre- we're not prepared to take those shots. I got a completely different reading of that. I thought what they were saying was that like no, we focus on the small fries. Because Yamaoka's entire campaign is we are a competitor to Noah because Noah is already essentially being handed the crown and he wants to go. No, he is not on that stadium alone. I am standing there next to him. Attacking him directly doesn't facilitate that plan. Attacking the smaller people and getting them out of the running does. Yeah, that was my take, too. And like. I was like, oh, so they're going to be saving this for the actual like end of the primary. Clear out all the small fry, make yourself the obvious rival to Noah. And then when it's just the 1v1, you shoot the missile that takes him down rather than you shoot the missile that takes him down. And now you and three other guys are scrambling to pick up his voters. Because the thing, the main component in these elections is charisma. And like whether you can sell a vision or a dream. Mm -hmm. So it's like you don't want to sell. Oh, well, his campaign hasn't been on the up and up. And, you know, he has donors from whatever. And then he sells something that resonates with the majority of voters. Then it's like, well, who cares? He's he's going to do what we want, you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And that's the harsh reality that's like tough to sell. Like on paper, it's like, well, obviously people are going to side with the fact that he's been dishonest and therefore they shouldn't support him. It's like uh, voters are swayed by whether or not they are sold a vision. Yeah, voters are swayed by emotion, not logic. Yeah, and we get a bit of that with uh, the actual target they decide to go after. Goldblum, one of the... Uh, other candidates who is projecting himself as the all-American family man and might be having an affair with a staffer. Might is a very... (laughs) Might is the operative word in that sentence, but the circumstantial evidence that the investigative team at Yamaoka headquarters managed to accrue uh, might is more likely than not, or at least it is at first blush. And so when they show it to the press, Goldblum has to respond to it. And even if he is wholly innocent, he doesn't seem it as he cracks under the pressure. And that was something that I liked about that because like, because this is a narrative and he's an antagonist, you kind of default assume the worst of him. But I kind of like that they don't actually like cut away to showing him to actually you know having had an affair with because it's like you know it's easy to make assumptions and that's the reaction that the voters get like they see him when he's denying it they see him sweating up on that podium people make their conclusion based off of um you know gut reactions the important part yamaoka makes clear is he doesn't actually care if gold blooms had an affair he cares that this is drama he wants to know how gold bloomer react to it because if he crumbles under the pressure he is not fit to be president and if he crumbles under this then it shows that he's not the all-american family man that he claims to be and that alienates a lot of his base Uh, again this manga is exceptionally well researched into the american political process (laughs) it's a very this is a very real moment because you know, I mean, we Gaijins have seen this exact story play out. Mm-hmm. And I, I got to say, part of the research is the research into American city skylines. And while we have done some playful ribbing at the art, the art is really good. And ooh, some of the glamour shots of American cities in two page spreads on this air. Mm, 
They're choice. They are choice. I had to make a note of the fact that a lot of the characters look a little bit too similar, but man, it's not that the artist isn't talented because like, you know, Mm-hmm. And like, like even some of the like, like character shots, it's really more in service to the style. Some of the some of the fla- faces blend into each other. But, you know, like that classic style is just really pretty just in general. But while Yamaoka HQ is enjoying this victory over Goldblum, Alex's youthful craving for respect is beginning to flare up as he has gone to sulk at a diner, as all American youth do. <laughs> oh, can I love how um, on the page, we, we're just saying how the art's really good, but I want to comment on the point that um, the posters on the side of this diner is repeated in every, like it's <laughs> the same poster in every angled shot, and it's like um, fried onions or something. Mm-hmm. Like it just says fried onions in English, and like... I'm like, that's close enough, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, look, the fried onions there are the best in all of New Hampshire. <laughs> I guess that's why they have two posters of it between each of the seats. <laughs> <laughs> we have a very interesting conversation between uh, Joe, Alex, and Rachel. Or Joe went to go talk with Alex for uh, journalistic reasons. And Rachel is just there to make him not do anything stupid that will hurt the campaign. Because Alex is planning on just going to some paper and and blowing this story wide open regardless. Mm-hmm. I'll show you how useful this can be. And we have we have a great moment. Alex goes to hand over his dossier full of damning evidence to Joe. And it's like, all right, Mr. Reporter, you go and publish this if you're really on my side. That's actually a, a kind of a part of the framing of why they don't want Alex to reveal this, because Joe is also from the outside looking in. You know, he's hearing the arguments and Joe's, you know, talking to Alex and basically he says, yeah, I see their argument about going after the lower guys, but like you do have a point. I don't know if there's some element of Joe sort of like airing out his abandonment issues with, you know, since they have the same father. Not that Alex knows this, but, you know, that maybe Joe kind of understands Alex feeling abandoned. Um, yeah. though he does also note that like alternatively he also might be the spoiled brat chafing under getting said no for the first time and joe does very tactfully tell alex no i won't do this i already made a deal that i wouldn't publish anything until after the campaign is over and might i say it's a very tactful very politician like response He might be uh, learning a bit more from his dad than he ever expected to. We then get to one of my favorite segments, if only because they put metaphors in the blender and set it to (laughs) it up. (laughs) They really really do. I mean, you can follow what they're talking about, but like, wow. Holy crap. What are they talking about? (laughs) (laughs) Well, first we have to have a Nam flashback. Yamaoka was in Nam is an Mm. important part of his backstory. Joe is speaking with uh, Arthur about why he's part of the campaign is why we have the Nam flashback, because Arthur is talking about the time that he met Yamaoka. He was in Nam dying because uh, Arthur was a field medic. Medivacking out someone who was in critical condition, Yamaoka had taken a bayonet to the stomach and was... Uh, from Arthur's perspective, he seemed to just be bleeding out and was um, babbling something about uh, being president. Maybe a name he couldn't really remember. And I then, can't die. I need to become president. And then he died, <laughs> according to Arthur. There's a there's a pretty sobering moment where Arthur talks about the fact that, you know, Vietnam vets were maybe not treated the best because they really weren't. Um, no, no. He came back to the U.S. and was treated like garbage and his wife and kids left him because in order to deal with all this like aggression against him, he took up drinking, became an alcoholic. The hostility he faced coming home, coupled with the trauma of everything that happened to him in Nam. It's a it's a very real moment. It is so real. Oh, my. It's such a good moment, though, because eventually he becomes a garbage man. And he's just doing his route one day and he hears a familiar voice coming from the steps of the courthouse, which is a young lawyer, Yamamoto, saying how he just won a case. 
I will never get his name right. I can guarantee you that. I, yeah, I actually, I've only ever gotten the name right when I've been looking at the notes. So you're, I'm with you there, Matt. <laughs> but anyway, yes. Yamaoka on the steps of the courthouse. Drops the two bags of trash he was carrying. And he runs over and it's like, it's you. You're alive. It's a goddamn miracle. And... Yamaoka recognizes him somehow too, even though he was delirious and bleeding out in the moment. <laughs> and yeah. hugs him is the big thing. Like, yeah, in the middle of this press conference, he stops all of that to hug this garbage man who ran up to him. Like, like Jake says, this manga really skirts the line of becoming melodrama. This is the most melodrama moment, but at the same time, it's right on the heels of that extremely real very sober talk about the plight of Vietnam veterans so and that you yeah. kind of, you kind of just roll with it. Here's a question I want to ask you guys. We know this is a story being told by Arthur, the campaign manager. What do you think about the validity of the validity of the story we just heard? I have some ideas about what this scene actually means. It really has a lot to do with where the story might go. So I, I was originally going to save my thoughts to the uh, uh, to this theory section at the end. I actually I, and I guess this just goes to show that I, I got pretty suckered into this because I had actually not considered that there would be a ulterior motive, that there would be a spin on this until you said that, Matt. I, I was just willing to believe that this was the miraculous tale of a washed out Vietnam vet finding the guy who he thought he failed to save in Nam and that moment turning his life around. Yeah, and I, I'm willing to also accept that because maybe we can just accept that flashbacks are entirely valid in this because mm -hmm. we don't know that. But like the big thing is he doesn't actually know Yamamoto survived. He seemed to think he died on the thing mm -hmm. and then he shows up. What thing? He died on not... the in Vietnam. He thinks he thinks he died on the trip to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is this being embellished? For Joe, it's entirely possible. It is a it is a Cinderella story taken to the nth level. And it is a campaign manager telling a story to a reporter who's going to tell the story of how who the campaign played who out. immediately like express hesitance hesitance to like explain his story. He's like, I don't have that much time. I don't really want to open mm. up one hundred percent. But he also, you know, knowing that he is a reporter and knowing maybe he is aware that the story will break, you know. Or maybe he doesn't know necessarily after the campaign, but he knows the story is going to be published. Yeah. So wouldn't you want it to have the most embellished, most fantastical story of like, well, I thought that candidate Yamoka was going to die and he didn't. And he came back with that experience from Vietnam and said, I'm going to make this country better and different. And, you know, it, it makes it, a better it, story that way. It, it makes all, it such a better story. It's all exceptionally inspiring. Yeah. But it's so inspiring that it kind of is just like, and this could be just because I'm jaded, but I'm just like, okay, which part of this is like me? Yeah, which part of this is? Uh... <laughs> which is the crux of the issue. And again, we have to come back to the primary question. How many people outside of Yamaoka and Joe know of their familial relationship? Arthur is clearly very close to Yamaoka. I mean, yeah, and I find it very difficult that he wouldn't know because even among other service members, like they know vaguely when they're sweet on some of the like when they're sweet on people. Like that's that's the big thing is um, Arthur didn't know Yamaoka in the service. Well, according to the story, he didn't know because, again, it, it, it's sort of an important point that Matt had brought up that like this entire thing could be a complete lie for all we know, you know. <laughs> None of this gets verified in any way, and it's a story about politics. The only verification we have is that we know that Yamaoka was a Marine yep. during the Vietnam period. He did land in Okinawa during that time frame. We also know he was injured. That was established when Joe did some background research at the Library of Congress. So we're not debating the fact that he was a veteran. We're not debating that he was a veteran who was in the the place and time that he claims to be. So it's just, you know, all the. Yeah, it's the it's the details of the story. Anyway, something that is entirely canon with one, what we read is uh, 
candidate Yamaoka basically ambushing Albert Noah's <laughs> press lunch. <laughs> I love this entire segment because it really goes to show both how freaking insane Yamaoka is to just take all of the gambles and it does the thing of throwing all the metaphors in a blender and hitting the f***ing upsetting. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Um, so w- we can establish what the groundwork for this is. Um, Vice President candidate uh, Albert Noah or... Uh, yeah, Albert Noah. Yeah, Albert Noah is having a press lunch at a Italian restaurant. Instead of going to the debate, he is refusing to do a debate. Yes. So essentially, because he's got 52 percent of the vote, he's got nothing to gain. So he's just going to be talking to the press while eating lunch at a place that is famous for presidential can for presidents in particular to have lunch at. What essentially uh, Yamaoka's plan is, well, I'll just show up anyway. And if he turns me away at the door, won't that look bad for him? He'll look like a coward. The king ne- should never turn away a challenger. A, a pretty a shockingly chivalrous way to look at American politics. I'm not saying I don't like it. I'm just saying it's not terribly realistic. Oh, talking about not terribly realistic. We'll get into Noah's, uh, mm-hmm. what Noah says. Somehow, as with all gambles, you know, I, I talked in the last episode of Tower of God about how somehow Bomb falls backwards into victory. I... I don't have that same complaint about Yamaoka, though he does. The universe does seem to think that he is the main character and gives him all of the advantages a main character is won't because he does walk right up to the Secret Service agents at the door of this place and says the vice president will want to talk to me. And he just is he gets in, (laughs) which um, to establish the main difference we get established between Yamaoka and uh, Albert Noah is they actually have very similar campaigns. The only difference is they slightly differ on education, and Albert Noah in particular wants to become the internet president. Yeah, he's really advocating this information superhighway. I think it's a flash in the pan, personally, but... It it is a little funny to read in retrospect, because he talks (laughs) about the internet as this great unifier of information. Little did he know we'd just record podcasts on it. That's on its surface. That's on its surface, though. The fact is, Yamaoka kind of goes into the nitty gritty, like how we. If you want to apply the internet rules, you could say he would apply it is different versus I'm just going to have it so it's accessible to everyone. Okay, clap, clap, clap. That's great. But this is somebody who's actually going to target and utilize it to benefit specific segments of the population. People who can already afford it. Oh, instead of just giving the entire everybody in the entire universe a megaphone and screaming all at the same time. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, you could do that. But would it be effective? Probably not. It would just be annoying. Es- essentially, what does happen, though, is um, Yamaoka gets through and uh, they make another table for him and Noah to sit across from each other. And on the checkerboard placemat... <laughs> Oh, that's purposeful, by the way. It's it's hilarious because Noah proceeds to tell him all of the great, like, entrees they have at this restaurant, all the different favorites of all the president. And then he just goes, I'll have a cafe au lait. And Noah goes, I will as well. And I'm like, why? <laughs> that is the least American thing you could order. Someone's done their research. And it's actually quite a kind of interesting that... You know, the fact that he's actively serving under one of the presidents, it's like you don't have any recollection of like even not necessarily all the presidents. Say you only have like knowledge of one or two presidents before you like you should have an idea of like what people get while they're at this restaurant. You know, what the, what are their main main dishes? What are they known for? Kind you of just thing. got a coffee with a coffee with milk. Mm-hmm. That's it. Look, it's fine. That's all you need in order to play four dimensional condiment chess. <laughs> Yeah, like, Yamaoka comes in with just like, well, you don't understand. Let's say this salt shaker is the sheep, and this pepper mill is the sheepdogs, and then proceeds to do nothing with those visual representatives and just talks about it off like an example in his head. Yeah, they use sheep and sheepdogs as a metaphor for the common people and the leaders of the common people 
for education, and then they play chess with the salt shaker and the pepper mill. Can we get off on the fact that Yamaoka is just like, I think the sheep should be educated. What do you think, Noah? And Noah, in front of press, says, no, sheep are stupid. You can try and teach them, but they're not going to learn anything. I'm like... That would never be anyone's public position. It's a ridiculous scene. It's it's like, we need to establish Albert Noah is the villain in this. How do we do that while still making him a believable Democrat? Oh, by making him a comically evil Democrat. Even if they were banking on the fact that the, the metaphor wouldn't be like immediately trans, like translated towards the common people, like that speaks volumes. It's just kind of like, I'm just assuming that no one will pick up on how this metaphor applies to them in their daily life. Because obviously everyone assumes that they're one of the, you know, sheep dogs. No one wants to admit to being a sheep. In, all so, fairness, in, in full defense of Albert Noah, his entire position is I want to do things that make like data sense. Yes, but his position is that he wants to be the leader of the free world. He wants to be a leader of the United States of America. Which yes. you have to acknowledge is not 100% dad driven. It's very emotional. It's very political. It's all of those factors. So leading it 100% data is not effectual. But that's what I'm saying, though. His position in this argument, he says with um, Yamamoka, makes 100% sense. Like, he's like, I mean, go up to that grandma and say, well, you're unaneffectual because you're a grandma and you're old and you're statistically going to die sooner than someone else. That's cool. I'm not saying any of that. I'm saying him saying this is a public position is laughable. Mm. I'm saying him saying this makes sense knowing his character. Yeah. yeah. Knowing his character, it makes sense that he would believe this. Why he's saying this when there's press nearby. <laughs> Ultimately, what it comes down to is the it's very much a moment for the audience that it's establishing that Yamaoka is presenting not literally, but basically to the audience that, you know, he's presenting himself as like the champion of the common people, raise up the uh, disaffected, whereas Noah is is more um, focused on on like the genteel. It, it, I think it is important to note for our dear listeners that Noah and Yamaoka are at a table by themselves. The press was kind of shunted off to the side and they're too far away to really accurately hear what's going on. They're just seeing this weird pseudo chess game with the with the condiment shakers. This weird pseudo chess game with like three pieces between the two of them. Like yeah. they try to explain it like it makes sense, but it really does. It's it's obvious what they're doing from the way that it's framed, but it doesn't actually make In all sense. All fairness. No one but Yamaoka and Noah understand it either. Like, even in <laughs> universe. Uh huh. It has and to be explained to everyone. Because, like, the big brain reveal the, oh, wow, the character's so smart moment is um, Yamaoka had beaten Noah in their chess game, big air quotes. But rather than go for the checkmate, he went for the stalemate to send a message saying, I don't want to beat you. I want you to be my vice president. That was the moment I was mentioning before where, uh, to some extent, throwing dirt on Noah is not necessarily the smartest long term strategy. I mentioned the bit about the press being too far away to hear because... Uh, once the mini chess game is over and Yamaoka is getting ready to leave, the press comes over and they see it's a stalemate. It, it Look at the metaphor slapping us in the face. It's a stalemate between Noah and Yamaoka, and that's going to be the headline for tomorrow. At which point Noah notes that he let it be a stalemate instead of outright beating me. Mm -hmm. That was a message to me, which... I'm glad they I'm glad they understood their little metaphor. I'm not saying that the press is dumb, but as a member of the press, I, too, would grasp onto the immediate metaphor right in front of my eyes. <laughs> I'm just also going to say it's real easy to stalemate when you only have one piece and your opponent has two. Like <laughs> <laughs> when you start the game with uh, one person only has a king and the other uh, person has the king and the queen. And that's the only pieces on the board from the start of the game. <laughs> well, OK, we've been saying that Noah and Yamaoka are the only ones who understand their metaphor. No, we have a third person who understands it. And it's your boy, George Tuck. This is this is when he decides to throw his hat in. Uh, kind of. 
He, he somehow thinks that this makes Yamoka cool enough to maybe check out one of his speeches. Yeah, Yamoka is clearly built different. If anything, George Chuck is impressed by the fact he just walked his way into that dinner. Yeah, uh-huh. well, that means he has the mentality of a winner. Tuck does ultimately end up joining Team Yamaoka and immediately starts producing, I gotta say, banger campaign ads. Oh, no, I would 100% be wrapped into these campaign ads. Like, they're pretty good. Uh-huh. Yeah. Dear listeners, I am a radio professional. I deal with commercials all the time. These are good-ass commercials. It is a young African-American child on the side of a road hitchhiking in the middle of like the desert (laughs) of like death valley or something and people are blasting by him in uh fancy cars and jets and whatnot as a voiceover is saying we talk about the future as if it's something that everyone will enjoy but are we only creating a resource that uh the rich and those with means will be able to benefit from who will be left behind on the information superhighway And the big thing is, is the kid is hitchhiking to the 21st century. Yeah, he's hitchhiking to the 21st century. That's what's on his little sign. And then a bus pulls up and who is driving it but Senator Kenneth Yamaoka. Can we get over the fact he's wearing a flannel with the sleeves pulled up to his elbows? (laughs) (laughs) The classic. This is the only time we've seen Yamaoka not in a suit. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, you know that that happens in every single campaign ad there has to be one with the candidate in flannel rolled up to the elbows to prove that they're a hard-working man who understands the plot of a common american and that's why i say these are banger campaign ads and it cuts from that to george tuck going all right we're gonna run this and we're going to run uh another version of it every uh five days leading up to the primary so we have 15 days till then that's three separate ads let's go people and this this is only the beginning of tuck's political wisdom Wizardry. There's not much else to say other than uh, we get to um, the next point is what we've been alluding to the insanity. <laughs> OK, I, I know I've been going off for the past couple of minutes about talking how cool he is. I need to go off more because Noah, realizing that he has been unintentionally put on the back foot by the <laughs> by the Italian restaurant incident, is thinking, all right, it's time to drop my bombshell. So I'm going to go back to Washington and make a speech at 5 o'clock p.m. on the uh, steps of the White House to reveal my big political platform moment and show off to the entire world why I will be the coolest president. The Yamaoka campaign gets wind of this, and they're like, he's going to do some big reveal. We have to get ahead of this somehow. We have to get the spin going. And Tuck is like, don't worry. He's making his speech at five o'clock. Ken, get your ass over to Washington. Go to uh, the reflecting pool. You're going to make your speech at 450. But how will we do that? Don't worry. I'm going to figure out what he's talking about. You're going to say it first. Can we establish the amount of like government espionage Tuck is committing to get this information? This is a bit much (laughs) in the best way. Here is the thing. The big bombshell is that in order to address illegal immigration from Latin America, the proposal from NOAA is we will have a three year plan to send a billion dollars into Latin America to create economic stimulus so that we have shared prosperity across the Americas and de-incentivize illegal immigration by having opportunity for Latin Americans at home. And like, that's wild. That is wild in so many ways. I had to applaud a Democratic candidate for offering like a solution to the whole um, immigration issue because a lot of a lot of candidates have not proposed what are we going to do for our, our Central and South American allies because to continuously take and take and take is not sustainable and it's not addressing the root of the issue so i had to i really struck a chord with like a positive chord of like this is somebody who truly understands the issue of there needs to be investment you know from within as opposed to just what are we going to do with these people who have been displaced we need to actually invest in those communities and with similar communities that can be most appropriately on the ground addressed with these with these displaced populations 
because the issue is not necessarily with, oh, we are superior and only we have the right way. It's we need to help stabilize. Yeah, it's it's a it's a good idea, honestly. The narrative is if you don't want to encourage like just open immigration is that you're a bigot. And it's just like I disagree with that narrative wholeheartedly because it's the issue is there's a systemic issue that needs to be addressed that people kind of sugarcoat. And that might be a tent, uh, might be a derivative of like exceptionalism of mm. like, well, obviously we're perfection. So we understand why people would come to us. But the issue is this is something that we don't have a solid one answer to. Th th this is getting a little spicy for the podcast. I'm telling it's you, I had a lot of thoughts. <laughs> it's a very good plan, which is why Yamaoka steals it. Yeah. He just straight up steals it. And like, you know, we're talking about how insane it is that that um, they're able to get this. Even the characters in universe are like, wait, how? Fuck his magic is the only explanation or he's deeply in trouble for treason. <laughs> there are only a couple of people in the who are all in the White House currently who knew that somebody's got to answer for this. What kind of freaking bureaucracy charms is Tuck throwing out right now? What sidereal bullshit is this that he's able to just figure this out and be like, all right, Ken, here's the entire script. Go wild, son. Yeah, the entire script got leaked and was told by Yamaoka in five minutes right before Noah was supposed to go on at 5 p.m. And say the exact same thing. Also, I know we skipped by this. Can we all just appreciate for a second that as the Yamaoka campaign team was flying to D.C., they were all eating burgers and drinking pop? Uh -huh. Yeah, because that is the mo that is the only American dinner you can have. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but I think we also need to note something else about my boy, George Tuck, is that he is the worst kind of person specifically because he does the thing where he makes references to historic events that are kind of like what's going on right now and expects the person he's talking to to understand perfectly what he means. And the problem is it works. What do you mean by that, Seth? I, I mean, like the moment when Tuck is using his five dots of contacts to be able to, like, pluck this information out of the void that he calls up a guy and is like you got anyone at 1600 pennsylvania right now seriously yeah if, if typically if we're, if we're ever going to reference the white house you just say pennsylvania avenue no one's 1600 pennsylvania avenue that's too specific he doesn't even say avenue he just says 1600 pennsylvania yeah it's a different address entirely and me immediately identifies you as an outsider Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. I feel like the disconnect is that the author probably didn't realize how, you know, how serious and, you know, insane this is, which you know, I again, I think it uh, does a good job of maintaining a, a lighter tone to keep it from getting too serious because mm -hmm. we all loved that moment. That was insanity. <laughs> I love the moment with Noah immediately afterwards where he proceeds to give the exact same speech and then doubles down on the amount. He, he gives the exact same speech and says, yeah, no, that proposal that Senator Yamaoka made, it's already made its way through Congress. It's ready to go. There, there was also a kind of cool. Noah is the antagonist. Since we know nothing about this series other than the um, 16 chapters that we read, we don't know how far Yamaoka gets in this election. So, you know, whether or not Noah is the primary antagonist of all of the rest of the series, or if um, he's not going to be. He's the just primary. the primary antagonist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey. We also need to address the, the fact that it is alluded to that Yamaoka is open and simultaneously Albert Noah is open to the idea that potentially they could be each other's vice president, like running mates. 
you know, we don't know how long he's going to be the antagonist, but like the kind of nice thing is, you know, it, there's the stuff that we mentioned about the uh, extremely well blended metaphor that, you know, establishes that Yamaoka, at least as far as the audience has seen, actually the champion of the common man. But they they do do a good job of not making Noah come off as like actively evil or anything, because one of um, his campaign consultants is like, will then just, you know, do a billion and tack a couple hundred million on the end. And Noah's immediate response is, I'm not going to promise something that I can't produce. The proposal's already gone through. I can't change it. That would be that would just be me lying, and I'm not going to do that. So you know, as much as as much as they are, you know, building him as the antagonist of this arc, they're also not making him seem like mustache twirling evil or anything. And I I appreciated that. People can get super intense over politics, but like I honestly believe that the overwhelming majority of people get into it with the best of intentions and. You know, don't you know? It's it's good to not demonize your political uh, opponents. They don't make him actively evil, which is something that they easily could have done. We don't know what his world what his worldview is and what caused him to shape it that way. Mm. And that's something like emerging into the political realm. You have to take into account like people's worldview and what they've experienced. You know, growing up and what um, interacting with people really does shape where their passions and where their promotion lies. And that's something that I think gets lost in the shuffle. It's just kind of like, there's obviously a reason why, and it might not necessarily be financial. It might, they might've had an encounter. They might've had an experience that shaped that viewpoint. And like the big thing we get, like the only real difference we get between Noah and uh, Yamaoka is that Noah is a realist and Yamaoka is an idealist. Noah agrees with Yamaoka on like, no, I would love to teach the sheep. But do you understand how much money would have to be thrown down the drain if those people don't want to learn? Not dis- he's not disagreeing with him. He's like, yes, it would be a waste, but I think the effort is worth it. Yeah, like, and like the big thing is like, that's an insane position to have publicly is my main complaint with it, but mm-hmm. it makes sense for his character. Yeah, exactly. We get to the end of this thing that would be an entire spy drama in and of itself, <laughs> compressed into a chapter and a half of a of a seinen manga. God, I really, I really enjoyed this manga. If you can't tell by how hyped, <laughs> how hype my voice is, he hates it. He hates yeah. it, guys. But uh, <laughs> we get back to New Hampshire just in time for Alex to go rogue. But this is kind of a non-starter of a plot point because his mom shows up and uses some well uses some well placed elitism to stop him from sinking the Yamaoka campaign. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Kenneth's uh, wife is not my favorite character. She hasn't done anything inherently wrong. Like she's not sabotaging. She's from her point of view just being honest that, like that's a, that's the big thing i really enjoy about this manga is no one is like mustache twirling evil people have reasons for what they're doing it's just when patricia has to go don't worry alex you're our only son the the framing of patricia is not the best i didn't mind it that much but i i totally see what you're saying matt because that that was a that was very much a scene that i kind of breezed over in the moment i had to double check like to uh, assess how much malice was being placed there and i'm like oh well technically you're she is speaking the truth like alex is their only son because joe isn't her son yeah so that's fair but it, it's the whole have faith in your blood thing yeah yeah it's, that's uh, kind of weird <laughs> that that it's is not. um it's, it's super not. waspy <laughs> Yes, but it's not <laughs> yes. weird. You understand it. You might not you might not agree with it, but you can understand why. No, I will 100% go on record on this podcast that being waspy is weird. Uh, <laughs> it, it's not unusual, uncomfortable and not healthy for the world at large. Yes. Yeah. That. Unusual? <laughs> no. But, but I would even argue that it extends beyond just wasps. Like there's a lot of cultures that like prioritize their own yeah yeah it's it's that mentality it's just they happen to be wasps yeah that's that's why i said that (laughs) this is some well-placed elitism 
yeah. that's that stops him from sinking the boat but uh we have a bigger problem than one rogue son we have old man winter himself come to slap up this campaign as a blizzard is dumping tons of snow all over new hampshire yes and we we gl- we glide into that gray area where it's just like eh bringing some yeah yeah this this chapter had me going like is is what they're doing legal (laughs) a lot this is your classic hero moment of uh main character goes out and does something incredible that gets the common the common people behind them and they become the big time hero who's gonna win the day and and fix the problems and all that but but (laughs) but this is American politics. And I just love the immediate reaction that Rachel interacts with is immediately like, what are you doing out here, ma'am? Do you know what time it is? Like, (laughs) no, you're coming with me to vote. (laughs) So we should probably establish the scene because of this blizzard. It is seriously affecting the turnout of the primary. And a lot of democratic voters are disadvantaged people who don't have the resources necessarily to go out and brave a massive winter storm to get to the polling place. And so this is going to hurt the uh, low. This is going to hurt low income, low minority income minority, minority voters. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And, the, and that's uh, smaller candidates have a tendency of doing uh, better with those people, which that was what that was what I was trying to articulate. Thank you. Jim. Yeah, it's the case where it's like, wow, my parents were uh, both history teachers and both uh, pretty heavily into politics. So I'm not as into politics as Jay and Sam are, but I also know a little. And it's like that's one of those moments where it's like, you know, I'm seeing them talk about how, you know, smaller candidates tend to uh, do better with minorities and the disadvantaged and bad weather disproportionately keeps those people home and therefore bad weather can be really bad for a small campaign. And it's like, wow, you know, I've seen national elections like that does happen. That's, you know, that's really well researched. The, uh, the manga solution to this plot point is, uh, questionable in terms of legality that moment where you remember that this is an outsider who's just really well researched let's use campaign funds to bus people to the polling places (laughs) the yamaoka campaign sends out the troops to go and transport folks from their homes to the polling places apparently insane hours because i mean this person did not have an issue with necessarily the storm per se he's also like do you know what time it is like what are you well tuck tuck man on campus himself says like oh do you want to rent some snow plows uh-huh and and it's like okay I'm a huge get out the vote proponent. I think that everybody should vote. It's your civic duty. But not at 4.30 in the morning. Come on. Not physically carrying people to vote. Not, yeah, not in the dead of night using campaign funds to have a fleet of vehicles go out. At, look, we're getting deep into the weeds here. The point in... Not even weeds. That's literally like logistics going on. Like the logistics of trying to get people up in the middle of the night and then to the polling places Mm -hmm. in a blizzard. I I think me and Jay talked about this and we came to the conclusion. I don't think they've done anything explicitly illegal, but boy, how do do they toe that line? (laughs) It's the kind of it's the kind of situation that would probably get laws written. I mean, it's a great it's a great manga scene. (laughs) It is 100 percent like a great like even in a movie like would be really cool. But you'd walk away going like, could they have done that? (laughs) Maybe at a more reasonable hour, you know, because the van that has Rachel and Joe in it and a whole bunch of voters gets stuck in a snow drift. And Rachel, consummate professional and dedicated member of this team that she is, gets out and immediately tries to push them out of the snowbank. Joe is trying to maintain his distance, his professional courtesy as a journalist, but he's like, I may be a journalist, but I'm also a human <laughs> being. He he gets out and he also starts uh, trying to push the 
the van out of the snowbank. And this galvanizes all of the poor working class folk to be like, hey, you, you bunch of pansies. We're going to we're going to come out here with all our Boston accents and strength to go and get us out of this out of this drift and we're gonna go vote no i do love the fact the second joe starts helping all of the people they were busing to the polling place even though rachel had been trying to push her a little bit suddenly get out to go hey you don't know how to push a bus we know how to push a bus <laughs> Phrases, many questions. the salient point here is they somehow managed to get 69 percent of the vote which nice and also how in the nine hells did they figure out what the turnout was before they f- finished counting, before they finished getting the returns from the precincts? They got a 69% turnout on the votes, not the the Yamaoka campaign. Yeah, but. 69% turnout of voters. They haven't finished getting all of the votes from the precincts yet. I have covered elections. That's not how it works. That's not possible. You have to have all the data up front to determine... Yeah. You haven't tried hard enough, Sam. Why don't you uh, yeah. have tuck magic? That's, that's, not how, that's not how numbers work. I think you don't believe hard enough. That's not how numbers work. That's not how primaries work. I have never seen a primary get more than 50% turnout. I can tell you how they were able to get those numbers, how they were able to get the turnout numbers before they were finished counting the vote. It's because it made a really good scene in this manga. And I will say, when they were giving the uh, election results, I'm not going to lie, this was easily my favorite moment in uh, what we read because... You know, I'm I'm following along like all the characters with like the news coverage of everything. And I got those like butterflies in my stomach of like watching a big election. But, you know, like as if I was invested in it. And it's like it's this goofy ass manga with all the stuff that it's done. And like a hundred percent, like when they go to the like, oh, Noah has 50 percent of the vote, but Yamaoka has 12. 17, 24, <gasps> Noah went down to 48. Wow. And it's just like, oh. I don't know how many of our dear listeners have actually been in the grassroots level of a poli- of a political campaign and have been in the HQ when the election results have been coming in. I have, and I have to say, this mangaka did a great job of capturing that. Yep. And like, yeah, it just I I felt like it was one of those ones where it's like, you know, I having you know read for, I think at this point it's like 15, fourteen or fifteen ish chapters, you know, having been that invested in the Yamaoka campaign, you know, I was one of the voters and had cast my vote and was looking to see if my candidate what? succeeded. It was that sort of like visceral gut reaction I didn't even realize I was having until I stepped back and I'm like wait a second, I'm reading Eagle, the making of an Asian American president. Why am I this invested in this? In the in the heat of the moment, they're all so excited. Like, yeah, they only took second place, but they got a quarter of the vote and broke the majority of the front runner, which is mm-hmm. insane for the first primary. Rachel, in a moment of extreme emotion, flees to a baseball diamond. Yeah. <laughs> As the dream that she thought was so distant. Because, you know, the moment when, like, you're approaching your goals and a dream no longer seems like a dream, but a a reality that you can grasp and also Mm -hmm. lose. She's having that moment and the fear is hitting her. And specifically, she's needing to rub snow in her face so she can feel something to realize she's not dreaming. Yes. And because the blizzard's still going on. And Joe walks up to her and, quoting the text box, in the passionate heat of the moment, grabs her and kisses her. And I'm like, remember, kids, no chromo. I sure am glad they established she was adopted early on. So this wasn't wasn't weird. Yeah, because like up until this point, it was one of those ones where it's like you can kind of sense where this is going. And it's like kind of hope that they don't. And they did establish that it's like not the worst possible option. But I this this isn't going where I think it's going is. Oh, okay, it is. Yep. Well, mm -hmm, got it. And then the weird thing is. The, like, next step, like, literally the next page is him being told he needs to follow Senator uh, Yamaoka to meet his um, brother-in-law in in New York City for some campaigning. 
Uh, and he's just like, oh, no, I'm going to be away from Rachel for a whole week. I'm like, dude, maybe chill your jets a little. Yeah, she just kissed you in the heat of the moment because of a huge victory for, like, your your father. So, I mean, it's just kind of like... Your shared father. Uh, yeah, it's just like, calm down, though. <laughs> like, calm down. What if she had just been a random co-worker that in the heat of the moment you just pecked on the cheek? And you're like, oh, my God, this co-worker is possibly leaving town for, like, the afternoon. How will I ever survive? Yes. <laughs> is literally the reaction he gives, so I thought that was pretty funny. It, yeah, but, it's, uh, it was pretty funny. We get to meet more of the Hamptons, though, and that's always fun. Yeah! <laughs> We're going to New York, New York, big city of dreams to meet with, to meet with uh, Charles Hampton, the man whose resume goes on for miles. Before we get there, can I just ask everyone, uh, how long did you spend looking at that skyline of New York City to try and pick out things? Because I did for an embarrassing amount of time. <laughs> yeah, lo longer than I'm willing to admit. There is a very detailed and very well-drawn skyline of Manhattan, and it is, yeah. And it's followed immediately by this glorious, uh, glamour two-page spread of Times Square. We're, we were uh, kind of lamenting how this wasn't super America Boo at the start, but no, this is very America Boo. Yeah. It definitely has its moments. Oh, oh, his his brother-in-law definitely <laughs> confirms America boo. Yeah. Um, <laughs> OK, I got a, I did. I did a grand total of five minutes of Googling, but there is a scene coming up where Yamoka and his brother-in-law are talking in a hallway and there is a like freeze in the background. Was that the goddess? Was that Nike goddess of victory? Because she was invoked earlier by the Noah campaign. I have no idea what you're talking about, Sam. Yeah, I. Do you Nike, know the, the goddess of victory, Nike. Nike is the Greek goddess of victory, and yeah. while she wasn't invoked by name, the Noah campaign said the goddess. She's of an victory, illusion too. Yeah, the She's goddess of victory too. is smiling on us, yes. and then there's a moment in this chapter where Yamoka and Charles are talking in a hallway and there is like a piece of artwork on the wall positioned between them in the paneling. And I wasn't entirely sure if it was Nike or not. <laughs> I completely missed that background element. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yeah, I didn't oh, pay too, too much attention. I see the exact panel you're talking about. I might just be insane. That's it possible. doesn't look Greek, if that makes you feel any better. <laughs> okay, I, I might just be insane. I mean, we already accepted that. And we love you regardless. Now you understand me. Like, I'm understanding having trash taste. You're understanding overanalyzing literally everything. All right, all right. For, uh, more and more, Jake and I grow, co <laughs> grow closer to fusing <laughs> into one being. Ah. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I'm, I'm actively looking at looking for this frame <laughs> over manga cast season two featuring Matt J and Jasmine. Oh no. <laughs> I hate it. I hate it. No. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we're in New York. Let's talk now. about Charles Hampton. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. This is, I know every time a character comes on, I say he's my favorite. Charles Hampton is up there. <laughs> <laughs> this guy is football metaphors. And American exceptionalism embodied into a single being. I play my college football for Yale. He's brother-in-law and college buddy to Yamaoka. Nepotism. He's also the Nepotism. He, he's also the CEO of the family bank and the chief stockholder of the law firm that Yamaoka worked for as a lawyer. His resume goes on for miles. <laughs> mm -hmm. Nepotism. In other words, his, res Nepotism. his resume just says... I'm winning at everything ever, and you can never be better than me. His nepotism just says Hamptons are leaders. Yeah, basically. Yeah. yeah. Because that is the family creed. As we learn in a... It, uh, Matt, I know you... Okay, bit of history for the listeners. Matt and I went to college together. We met in an anime club. Matt was very in, uh, adamant on uh, Mondays in the club being Sports Anime Monday. Matt, did you bring Sports Anime Monday back with Charles Hampton? <laughs> In fact, I, I might do that still. My <laughs> genre almost fits, like, fits into a sports anime. It's competitive. It has that back and forth between sports, you know. I mean, by that definition, literally every shonen is a sport. I mean, yes, it involves fight, whether it be um, wrestling or whether it be 
Um, then you agree with me. Everyone should watch more sports anime. It's really good. (laughs) Indeed. But uh, we have a moment where uh, Charles agrees to an interview with Joe talking about the time that Charles and Kenneth had in college together at Yale. I went to Yale, everyone. Yale. American University, I know. So that's where they went. That's not yeah, true. There's also, there's because, also Brown and uh, Harvard. Rachel went to Georgetown. It's actually pretty yeah. important. You're right. They named all the DC schools. Well, that's not true. Uh, like Yale's Yale, not DC. Y- y- Yale, Yale's New England. <laughs> the important thing is that Yamoka and Charles were on the football team together, and Charles was always the QB. He was the quarterback. Yet, yeah, and uh, Yamoka was the substitute until they had the big game against Kentucky. <laughs> Anyone from Kentucky. Kentucky ruined everything, apparently. <laughs> the coach the coach went to uh, Charles and was like, look, you're a great QB, but you don't have the tactical mind needed to operate under pressure, which Yamaoka absolutely does. So you're on the bench. They established that's not what a quarterback does at the very yeah, least. Like that's what quarterbacks do. A quarterback is having the best <laughs> arm to throw to people. For the plan that has already been established. <laughs> this is the this is the coach saying Yamaoka is a better coach than me, <laughs> so I'm making him the the default main character of this uh, Friday night. Why not make him, Why not make him junior coach? Like, if we're arguing that he's more like t- like tactician, then make him coach. Make him junior coach. But I don't know how American collegiate sports works, so I'm making him the main character in a for this one game is the big thing a coach says for some reason. Yeah, I don't know enough about sports ball, so I was just along for the ride for this whole. That's OK. I expect this thing, uh, this manga expects you to know nothing about football for this section. Of <laughs> I mean, sense. they obviously um, know nothing about football. And I'm just like, what? Well, uh. Yes. But either way, Yamaoka put on such an amazing, immaculate display as the QB in this that Charles was like, the coach is right. He is the main character of this universe. I must acquiesce to him. Coach, make him QB and I will be his defensive back. And I will take care as a defensive back. I will take care of everything that slips past him. Everything he messes up on, I will defend. Except for the one thing except for the one thing I couldn't block, which was him going to the end zone with my sister. <laughs> he literally says that exactly. Is a direct quote in this manga. <laughs> um, <laughs> Gross, <laughs> but okay. <laughs> what a weird conversation to have while you're describing your relationship. To, like this flashback is happening as Charles is explaining how he knows Yamamoka to Joe. Yeah. I mean, it had to be obvious. I mean, that's his brother-in-law. They went to college together. Come on. Like, how many... How? What were you expecting? In a ridiculously bougie law office. Like, this isn't a law office. It's it's Pitbull's penthouse. <laughs> it's essentially just a bunch of football bros who happen to be born into nepotism, so they're where they are in their lives. They're still football bros. So in, in all fairness, Charles does begin his interview with Joe with going like, I know all the good and bad things about Kenneth Yamamoto and Yamamoto's just like, well, maybe just tell him the good things for now. Let's, uh, you know, he snores, guys. He's kind of gross. The sort of point for the characters in the universe that is being made here is that um, the difference, the contrast uh, between Charles and uh, Yamaoka is like Charles was a good QB, but he struggled to come back at a disadvantage, whereas Yamaoka, no matter how bad things look, he, you know, he can turn a situation around. He gets people to to like and trust him, believe he's capable just, you know, by being around them. It's another example of that. You know, we've been talking about how he's, you know, he's presented as the idealist. And it's like he also did just go for the, you know, blow the adultery story to get rid of one of his political opponents things. This one, uh, more so than the Vietnam story, was the one where I'm like, how much of this is spin? How much of this is a pre-prepared story that both of them worked out in advance? Exactly. But I, I think it's important to note 
that uh, something that you said, Jacob, just brought this to my mind, maybe because I, too, got wrapped up in the immaculate charisma of Kenneth Yamaoka. He did drop the whole adultery scandal on one of his political opponents while literally having his bastard child as the press attache. Well, we don't know if it's different than adultery then. Because we don't know if he was married at that time. The whole point was to make Goldblum not seem as the immaculate American family man that he made himself out to be. And having a bastard child is just about the most unimmaculate American family man. But he'd be able to save himself and say that I invited my bastard child that I just found to cover my campaign. Here's yeah. the big thing about that though, is Joe is coming to the realization that if that is enough to end Goldblum's career, what about having a bastard child in a, in a foreign country? Yeah. Maybe it's enough that you would have that woman killed by some kind of gas leak and then steal any evidence of your relationship. When it was originally presented to us, uh, Joe's mother's death, it's this sudden tragedy no one could have expected, but nobody really thought it was suspicious. Like, you'd be paranoid to think it was suspicious. But then the photo was missing. And now all of this. Like, the big thing that is running around in the background for Joe is that the photo was stolen. And it sure is convenient that his mother died right before his father, who doesn't want to, anyone to know he exists, which was very much established when he was introduced to the Hampton family as his press secretary a co covering the campaign which is like why 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 at that point even really bring up the fact that that is his like he acknowledges there's a relationship there but he's still technically correct in introducing him as his press, press secretary yes he is his son that he's hired as his press secretary everyone's equal remember i've got some theories we'll save that for the discussion but but we do end on a very exceedingly important panel mm -hmm. patricia Boom. yamaoka's wife Boom. real realizing who takashi joe is i don't think she realizes she knew there wasn't no realization she's realizing to the audience <laughs> yeah she's realizing to the audience and she swears takashi joe you will not become his heir. When Joe first met her, the implication was that she m might know, but at the very least, she suspects. And some of the scenes that we've seen of her, she was investigating, and basically, she has just confirmed what she believed. Yeah, and uh, that is where we leave off at the end of Volume 1, the tail end of Chapter 16, which is, whoo, whoo, spicy. <laughs> spicy meatball spicy meatball like the kind that yamaoka had in the uh, second chapter <laughs> so we come to the discussion section of our podcast starting off with favorite character i think it's been made abundantly obvious at this point that george tuck is my boy he is the best and i will uh broker no argument unless it's arthur he is also very good <laughs> Yeah, Matt here. I'm going to side with Arthur. Uh, George Chuck's cool, but Arthur just has that like matter of fact, like he doesn't like Joe. And I love that about him because why would you like Joe? He is press being brought into your campaign. Yes. Like he is hostile to him at all. And I just love Arthur. Arthur is the kind, Arthur is the kind of guy that would punch me in the face as soon as I met him. And I would still respect him for it. Well, that's the thing. The The really nice thing about Arthur is that he's very matter of fact, hostile towards Joe. He He's never really a jerk. It's not really personal either. It's just it's just kind of like the he just understands the positioning of it. It's not really personal per se. I don't even think. Yeah, he, he understands that the press are vultures and you need to hit them with a stick. No, 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 Matt. They're scorps. Oh, they they're are scorps. scorps. <laughs> that's yeah, right. We've got to integrate that into our vocabulary. Scorps. <laughs> Scorps is the most hilarious, like, fake American slang I've ever heard. I will be sure to tell the rest of my friends in the newsroom when I go back to work. Way so. to go, Scorp. <laughs> uh, as I said at the top of this uh, episode, I look forward to be called that the rest of my life by these three. <laughs> Favorite character for me is sort of an interesting one. This is another one where I didn't really feel a particularly strong attachment to any one of the characters. Um, while we were discussing it, I sort of I think I, I came to more of an appreciation of 
how Noah is definitely the antagonist of this story, but he's not really a villain. And I really appreciated that. So I feel like Noah would probably be my favorite character if you twisted my arm. But like, you know, obviously Tuck has his absolutely spectacular moments. Arthur's great. And honestly, you know, like the um, Joe and uh, ya- uh, Yamaoka are also really great characters, too. Um, mm-hmm. Nobody really nobody really like wholeheartedly stood out for me personally um, as a favorite character. Tuck does have the benefit is there is a panel of him wearing a uh, ball cap that has an American flag on it and says United States. Yeah. <laughs> I love Tuck. Okay, I I don't know what it is, but everything about his character design makes me love him. <laughs> because you see him as you in he like has... 30 years. If only I had Tuck's drive. <laughs> like, like, I, if I had the level of drive. It's not just drive, it's also just... connections, because damn, he could snap it's his the fingers. the willingness like, to commit large-scale nope. treason. <laughs> Yes, the 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 drive, the connection, the lack of morality. If I had that at the level of Tuck, man alive, I'd be the greatest reporter in America. But no, I do not possess any of that. So I can only look up to him. (laughs) Need to gain his magic powers. Yep. (laughs) Yeah, I need to be chosen by Jupiter and become a sidereal of secrets. (laughs) Jay, you got a favorite character? I do. I have to say that Joe is my favorite character just because he comes into this, um, you know, from a point of grief and mourning. And he is completely, you know, at a very base level coming to grips and understanding the intricacies of the American um, political process. And also navigating his own, you know, process of like what his familiar ties are, family ties are. And it's kind of like I come at him kind of like from the most innocent viewpoint, I guess, because he is viewing this completely new kind of like um, fresh, a fresh set of eyes kind of. And what I really gained from this past reading was it was just kind of refreshing to kind of see an outsider's viewpoint of the political process that, you know, is something that. I encounter on a daily basis. I mean, that kind of dives into our next question. Yeah, which is, uh, so in case y'all haven't noticed this, the four of us are American ass Americans. (laughs) We have all to a greater or lesser extent participated in the political process, the electing of presidents and representatives in the Congress, both federal and state. And local. And local. And local. Participate in your local elections, folks. Participate in your local elections. Vote in every election that you can. Seriously. It's the entire point. Mm hmm. But once vote often, Matt keeps Matt keeps sending messages in the discord to say not to get political. But I will say that (laughs) vote in literally every election you can. No, I've been an I've been very I've been an advocate of let your voice be heard no matter what it is, because if you don't let it be heard, don't complain. It's literally it's literally the entire point. Our country would not exist if that was not the point. Looking at this political drama written by an outsider by a by a japanese man it is again shockingly well researched this is clearly a guy who looked at the american political process thought this is a hilarious mess i need to know everything about it so i can write a chaotic drama ridden manga about it and honestly he's not entirely wrong it is it is a hilarious chaos ridden mess I mean, the thing that I took away from like the outsider's perspective, looking at our politics, like the celebrity aspect of it is one of the things I hate most about politics. And the story even addresses the fact that the celebrity elements of of this entire process are stupid and we shouldn't talk about them. Let's proceed to talk about them anyway. You know, it's it's kind of sad, but like, you know, charisma and feelings and, you know, setting logic aside for, you know, people's reactions is an inescapable element of politics in 
any system, especially a system where, you know, the people are electing representatives, the sort of like clear eyes on how little policy matters sometimes, that sometimes it's purely down to how someone says the exact same thing. You know, and like there's mm -hmm. there's a lot of politicians, you know, both sides of the aisle of the major parties and also like independents and stuff like that. There's a lot of people that agree on a lot of stuff. And sometimes it just comes down to how someone says it, you know, what party they're aligned with can can be the crux of a political divide. And it's, you know, it, it's one of those ones that it's so frustrating to see that element of celebrity laid bare, but man, is it accurate. And it even points out the fact that that's, you know, as frustrating it's as ultimately yeah. foolish. Well, it, and, and as frustrating as it is, it's ultimately always going to be a part of the system, no matter how idealized you make the system. We're human beings. We're not robot. Well, I mean, you guys are human beings. I might be a robot, but you know, we're, we're not <laughs> definitely a robot. As Matt alluded to earlier in the episode, Jay and I are the most heavily involved in politics uh jay what was your take on all of this i found it very comical i would have to agree with jacob mm -hmm. just with the fact that it was very interesting to see an outsider's perspective and there were a lot of observations that were like bought on that perhaps i would not have seen as so overtly obvious i guess where it's just like, wow, I didn't know an outsider would be so aware of these little intricacies. And then some of them were just like, I guess, lost in translation nonsense. <laughs> Those moments where you remember it's an outsider. <laughs> yeah, but it, it was it was pretty, pretty, pretty close for an outsider's point of view. And it was very comical. I got I got a great amount of amusement. All right, uh, Matt. What did you think? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to retread any ground everyone else has gone over, but like it's it's spot on for how it like portrays the American uh, political process with the added comedy of just like the slight missteps of like understanding cultural norms to the point of it seems like parody in cases. And that's just a level of like hilarity that I just love. Like they all got on the plane to eat burgers because that's what you do. <laughs> It's an unintended level of cultural commentary by sheer happenstance was on the nose mm -hmm. and hilarious yeah. and hilarious for that. So uh, the only other thing um, I mentioned uh, earlier that uh, I had a plot prediction. Does anyone else have any ideas where this story might go? Because there was one thing I wanted to mention. So I, I, I'll i go off on mine because mine's probably not based in a lot. I. I'm wondering how close they're going to play the thing about um, Yamamoka had Joe's mother killed because mm. her death does not seem like an accident, especially because of the fact that photo is missing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, also the fact that there's no recollection of her, like the fact that, you know, it was just too much of a freak accident because we don't know the standard health safety standards of the shop that she was working in, for mm -hmm. instance. Was this potentially leaky pipe not scouted previously? Why mm -hmm. all of a sudden, oh, it was just a leaky pipe. And it's like, but she's worked there for decades, you know, slaving it away. It was her restaurant. Yeah. So why wasn't this seen before? What, what, what happened to, you know, create this leak out of nowhere? You know? And it's like, oh, wow, suddenly the last major tie linking Takashi Joe to Japan is severed and he can just be yanked across the ocean to America and kept an eye on. If anything, why not just offer him a job like it didn't even mm -hmm. have to be like his mom had to disappear. Why not just say, hey, you have this one once in a lifetime like job opportunity. It's great. You should definitely go here. I I'm willing to say because drama. I did to kill off his mom. His mom didn't do anything for all we know. E exactly. And that's why I say I don't really have plot predictions. Normally, I would be like theorizing and throwing stuff up on the cork board with red string linking photos and all of that. I don't know what it is about this manga. I'm just kind of willing to let it go and ride along with Joe experiencing the revelations as they come. I so I don't so much have a plot uh, plot prediction as I am eagerly 
awaiting the moment that uh, Joe's relation to Yamaoka is revealed to the Hamptons. It's Yamaoka's intentions with Joe, because if it's ever revealed that you killed his mother... Talk about ending political careers. Yeah, I am just looking forward to when all hell breaks loose in the I mean, Hampton household. Do you household. want him to respect you as his father, or do you want to be like, okay, cool, you're my dad I've been looking for my entire life. Why the hell did you have to kill my mom? Like, what what reason did you have for that? Well, we're, we're not sure that happened. <laughs> Yamaoka is either an absolute master of political opportunism, or he is the most bright-smiled, kindest dictator we've ever <laughs> seen. It could be either or, or a combination of both. It could be either or. Yeah. I'm not, sh- I'm not sure, but all I know is that to answer the other uh, ubiquitous question in our discussion sessions, I absolutely want to read more and find out. Okay, Jacob, what's your uh, what's your floodgates of uh, theories? Okay, so it's it's one thing in particular. I could be totally dead wrong on this, but I am I am dead convinced Yamaoka is uh, the uh, survivor of a pair of twins and that the Yamaoka that Arthur met in Vietnam did die on that helicopter ride. A hundred percent with you. Like, I don't even think it has to be twins. I am dead convinced that that Yamaoka, who was Joe's father, died on that helicopter ride and that he had a brother. Oh, then why would this Yamaoka, like, need to have Joe with him? And why would he sow the seeds of this is my son? I'm just saying the manga has done so much legwork to throw suspicion on whether or not that's even the same Yamamoka. Like, why? Yeah. What do you mean same Yamamoka? Well, because... The picture of Joe's father, you don't get to see his face. You have Arthur tell the story he thought Yamamoka died and was surprised to see him in life. But you could argue that if they're twins, if they're brothers, they would have a similar face anyway. So there would be a semblance. Well, that's what Matt's saying. I'm saying the twin thing isn't even necessary. Yeah. Like they could just be in the same platoon. But I mean, what would be the payoff benefit of him claiming Joe? Even if it's between him and his, and Joe as well, you are my son. You have the reveal that like, I'm not really your father. Your father died in Vietnam. Yeah. And and there's also the fact that so much of what Yamaoka is doing is controlling what Joe is actually releasing to the public. But I mean, is, is Yamaoka trying to be like a novelist or is he trying to be an actual presidential candidate? Because I mean, all of this sounds great written into like a... Uh, a biography or some kind of like best-selling novel fictional manga we're following (laughs) yeah yeah but it doesn't make any sense like politically to say oh by the way i lied to this young reporter brought him over to the united states you know i was just messing with him it was fun it makes a good story when it's released after the campaign is over i'm just saying that if he fails this election He's not going to have another chance because I'd be so pissed off that he lied about something so intimate and so detailed. I'd be just like, I can't trust you. You should lose your senatorship. You should lose everything. This is something you don't touch. Yeah. And we've seen that Kenneth Yamaoka is willing to bet it all. It seems like the kind of thing that the story would do more so than the character. I, I think the uh, the universal theme that has been made obvious in this episode is that jay is absolutely correct from a very rational very practical political standpoint in the world of crazy over-the-top saning manga (laughs) drama saying like politically no one would endorse a candidate who dragged whether he's a foreigner or not dragged a person across the world on like such a fabricated lie got their hopes up, and then blatantly oh. paraded it around. Hold on. He didn't drag him across. He didn't drag him across the world on a fabricated lie. He, that's still he's across the world for the same reason to yeah. cover the campaign. Yes, but I mean, anyone reading this account that Joe is going to publish is going to be like, OK, he came over for a job. You revealed to him that he was his father all this stuff happens in between by the way you revealed that you weren't actually his father and that his father died well that's, like that's probably not the point of revealing it to him but yeah. I'm just that saying, wouldn't make a good story but i'm just saying either way that just is not politically viable it's like either this is your only run and you fail 
and then this is published, and then you never have another shot. So either you make it or you don't ever again. Okay. You have one shot either way. And Yamaoka is the kind of crazy, insane son of a bitch who will go all in on that one opportunity. Yeah, and then he just sends Joe back with no mom or no anything. That's what I mean. Like, yeah, screw the yeah, screw this guy. He is no longer worth anything to me. I'm getting rid of it. Like that's yeah. As as Joe said of Yamaoka, he is a consummate politician. And I'm saying, as someone who pays attention to presidential races, I would immediately blacklist this guy. Even if he won, I would be like this guy. I mean, that's really cool that you would blacklist him if you were part of his inner circle and knew all of this. Yeah. But like. No, it's it's going to be published. It would be published if he was elected, if the election is favorable. This would be published immediately afterwards. And it would also sound insane, which would allow Yamaoka to be like, no, this is freaking crazy. You think any of this is real? The thing is, we don't know where the story is going. This seems like a twist that the story would pull out. Which, again, I think answers the question, would you continue reading this? Absolutely, yes. I need I mean, to yes, see where the sense is. I'm prepared are. to be pissed off about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. I definitely continue reading. It was a surprisingly popcorny read for a political drama. I was kind of surprised about that. I breezed through it, and it was honestly really a fun read. So yeah, no, uh, Matt here. I I definitely continue reading. This was well written. Like for as deep a like, they humanize a lot of like the really like complicated political stuff. And like, it's it's very easy to read. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if reading this doesn't get you into the political process as an American, if if you, dear listener listening right now, are an American, I mean, hey, it's it's wild. But getting into it is uh, it's a ride that won't leave you bored. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> it's an experience. Thank you, everyone, for listening to the Over Manga Cast. Make sure to like us on your preferred podcatcher. Uh, I personally use Spotify, though you can use uh, iTunes or go to redcircle.com. And, of course, follow us on all of the social medias. We're on YouTube. We're on uh, Twitter. We're on Instagram at Over Manga Cast. You can tell us how our opinions are absolutely wrong. That is memes. I like memes. Uh, also send us memes yes that's very important and tune in next thursday because at long long last matt will finally be able to drink of all of our suffering as a great draught of misery <laughs> i'm not suffering i'm living <laughs> because we are finishing chainsaw man chainsaw man is life i love this i'm so glad i'm so hyped chapter 71 to 97 next thursday get ready for screaming uh i want everyone to save the audio of jay saying i love my life this is going great to save that and juxtapose that with how she feels during next episode <laughs> challenge accepted i don't think you know me as well as you think you do okay oh. I've read Chainsaw Man, so <laughs> this is this is filling me with the <laughs> utmost confidence on how things are going to go. Oh, good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, everybody.